So I think maybe slowly uh, let's start. I wish you all a, a very uh, warm welcome to the House of the EU today. Today is a safer internet uh, day. Thank you for your interest. Uh, some of you may have seen that uh, there was already fake news today uh, in the internet world somewhere that there was again no school. Uh, my, my teens didn't fall for that. Uh, they pointed it out to me but spotted it before I did. Uh, there was also the fake news out there that this conference actually wouldn't take place today. Uh, I don't know if a few people fell, uh, fell for that. No, we are here and we're happy that you are here. Uh, Safer Internet uh, Day is really an EU uh, initiative that in the meantime uh, is actually being uh, followed in uh, about 150 countries in the world each uh, February. Um, so uh, I think this is really the, the classical uh, example of where added value of working together also beyond nations' boundaries uh, is really uh, the case uh, by really the definition of what we are, uh, what we are discussing here, which is uh, really manipulation uh, of uh, citizens. What the objective is, uh, of course, is to promote safer use of online technology. This concerns uh, very much young people today. They are confronted with other challenges or new challenges uh, from uh, online bullying, uh, to other things that didn't uh, exist before. They take most of their information uh, from uh, the internet, but obviously this is also important for uh, adults. We know that uh, the internet is a powerful tool. It offers lots of opportunities uh, for gaining knowledge, for skills, etc., etc. But of course, we all know uh, that there are many uh, risks involved with this. There is also the artificial intelligence uh, dimension. Of course, there are so many facets uh, to this. Today, we want to uh, focus more on the disinformation, uh, manipulation, and awareness raising aspects. So. Uh, there is uh, uh, many, many of you are here today, and I'm very happy to uh, to welcome our two speakers uh, today. First of all, uh, Mr. Chris Pinchen. Uh, he was one of our uh, what we call local heroes uh, in uh, the context of our EU protects uh, campaign. Uh, because he was working and is still working as a trainer on a safe internet uh, use, especially for kids and teens of fundamental importance. He's also co-author of the new uh, Be Secure uh, school training program uh, that is currently uh, working on a pan-European uh, solution for digital stalking. Uh, I think m many of us have uh, kids. Uh, many of us also have uh, maybe grandchildren. So I think this is uh, of extreme importance. And thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. I also welcome Raphael Vino. Uh, who works at the Computer Incident Research uh, Center of uh, Luxembourg, which is a government-driven uh, initiative designed to promote systematic response to computer security threats and incidents. I hope that's correct. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I think uh, really not a week um, uh, goes by without new evidence uh, from the media and also from uh, academia uh, showing us really what a threat uh, to democracy, uh, disinformation and related forms of external interference uh, pose today. Disinformation, it's not something that's uh, simple, it's extremely complex. It is also constantly uh, evolving. Uh, we are con confronted with uh, different issues on the topic from, um, from migration to uh, climate change to also debates about health or uh, vaccinations, for example. Uh, 
Um, but of course, we are also directly confronted with this ahead of elections, whether they are regional, national, also uh, European uh, elections. There are different motivations to this uh, disinformation. Uh, some motivations may be economic, others may be more uh, political. There is also a vast or a myriad of uh, state and non-state uh, actors uh, with very diverse uh, tools uh, and manipulation techni techniques. So this is uh, very vast and today we want to concentrate on uh, a few aspects uh, of, of this. It is extremely serious. Uh, the uh, former commission under the presidency of Jean-Claude Juncker already tackled this um, from different angles. An action plan against uh, disinformation uh, was uh, developed uh, where we were working on uh, better uh, detecting and uh, countering disinformation. A rapid alert system was also set up that allowed institutions to work together with member states to share information uh, as quickly as possible. This is also uh, important ahead of, uh, of elections because the disinformation campaigns are really quite uh, widespread. Uh, so this platform really allowed states and institutions to exchange information. And uh, under the former commission also a code of conduct uh, on disinformation was signed with online platforms. Um, maybe some of you, uh, if you are active on social media, have already uh, seen uh, the consequences of this. The results are really quite impressive. I will just uh, uh, give you a few numbers. Uh, in the days before the European elections, actually more than 600 groups on and Facebook pages operating uh, in Europe were reported to have spread disinformation or have used false uh, profiles. Uh, to, of course, artificially boost then uh, either a political party or, uh, or um, uh, political tendencies. Uh, these pages generated more than six, uh, 760 million views. This is just for, uh, for the EU. Uh, on Twitter, uh, 77 million spam or fake uh, accounts uh, were also identified. Um, I'm personally a fan of Twitter. It is my uh, the social media of, of my choice. Uh, I can assure you that uh, the rep is not a uh, representation of the commission is not involved uh, in spreading any uh, fake uh, fake uh, news or fake information. I think we really try hard via this means also to inform uh, citizens. Up uh, there in the corner, you have uh, Facebook, Twitter uh, accounts of the rep, which uh, I invite you uh, to. Follow if you are uh, interested. Um, I mentioned some of these figures and what uh, already under the former commission uh, we have tried uh, to do. Of course, so much still needs to be done, uh, and that's also why why we're here today because this is a matter that continues continuously. Also, uh, needs to preoccupy uh, the initiatives that come from uh, the new commission under the presidency of Ursula uh, von der Leyen. Uh, lying is, of course, a problem everywhere, also on uh, on the uh, internet. Uh, but I think that the bigger uh, problem is that people um, actually believe those lies. So uh, that's what we want uh, to discuss uh, here today uh, by the means of raising awareness. And without further ado, again, welcome uh, to all of you here today. And I leave the floor uh, to our uh, two speakers uh, of today to make their presentations and uh, engage also in an exchange with you. If you have questions or comments, please don't hesitate. These are real experts on the subject. Thank you again for being with us today. Okay, uh, well, thanks for the, the introduction and pointing out the, the, some of the scope of the situation of disinformation uh, that we're dealing with. Um, today, it might seem that it's kind of a strange topic for a, for a uh, presentation, but today I'm going to be talking about Boris buses, wine boxes, kippers, and dead cats. So if you know what any of those things are, well done, but by the end of this you will, and you probably will regret that. Um, if you ever want to get in touch with me or follow anything, um, this is where you can get in touch with me. And this uh, thing at the bottom here is a link to when I'm researching topics and things for talks, I keep all of the material, all of the links and all of the information I look at, at that uh, address. You may or may not wish to go there. It's, uh, you have been warned. Um, so 
disinformation takes many forms and in fact this image is my favorite example of disinformation because when we when we talk about disinformation we often talk about fake news fake news this fake news but fake news is a terrible term disinformation is a better term but people we also need to look at the the definition of disinformation and this is for me is the perfect example it's just a beautiful, beautiful example. Apart from the fact that they're lying about the state of the couch. That couch is in a terrible condition. It's a slightly used, but it's obviously been used. But no pets. I mean, dude, if you're going to put that image on the internet, <laughs> you know, talk about it. So disinformation is a huge, vast subject, as uh, Eureka pointed out. And today we're going to focus on a specific part of it. And we're going to talk about the... Uh, the it's kind of an art of military strategy. We're going to talk about um, how to make a bus, uh, believe it or not. And I'm going to get a very in interesting person to discuss this topic. So I'd just like to you to watch this video. What do you do to relax? What do you do to switch off? Uh, I, I, well, I like to paint um, or I make things. I like to... What do you make? I make... I have a thing where I make models of... I mean, when I was in like, well, Mayor of London, we build a beautiful... I make buses. You make models of buses? I make models of buses. See, they're going to be do, in Downing Street. So, so what I do... No, what I don't make models of buses, but what I, I make is... I get, I get old, um, I don't know, wooden crates. Yeah. Right? And then I paint them. And they uh, and they have two, two. I suppose it's a wine. It's a box that's been used to contain two two wine bottles, right? Right. And it will have a, 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 a dividing thing. Yeah. And I turn it into a bus, and I so I put, I put passengers. You really want to know this? You're making you know the, you're I making I buses. Yeah, you're I making paint, cardboard I, buses. I paint, okay, no, I that's paint, what you do to enjoy yourself. I paint, no, I paint no. the passengers enjoying themselves. Okay, great. On the wonderful bus. Great. Ah, no. um, okay, so are there any fellow temporary Europeans in the room, like myself? Anybody else in the room a temporary European? I'm the only temporary European in this room? I mean, you know, I'm a European till the end of the year. Do you refer to the European Union or Europe? Oh, that's a, com that's a complicated question. <laughs> okay, okay, I, I give you that. Temporary member of the European Union, yes. Um, so, I can tell you that it's very personal. Uh, you know, there was an incredible amount of disinformation in Brexit, um, where we are today. And so, this has real life consequences. We see things in the press, we see all of this, but in real life, my, my life has been screwed up for the last three years and is going to be continued to be screwed up, and that's first world problems. Um, this guy is now the architect of the uh, thing, and, and he makes buses, okay, and it, from wine boxes. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a wine box, and he puts happy happy passengers in there. Now you may ask why I'm showing this video and why, in fact, Boris Johnson at that time was talking about making these uh, these buses. This video was taken from before he was uh, Prime Minister, in fact, before he was the leader of the party. And if we go back uh, some time, Boris Johnson used to be the Mayor of London. And, you know, in London we had the, the, the big red, the double-decker buses. And uh, they were the old red buses were deemed to be uh, dangerous because you could jump on and off the bus and also they were kind of discriminatory to people with disabilities they couldn't use those buses so they changed the bus they made a long bus nobody liked it because it wasn't a typical london bus and boris is nothing if not populist so when he came the mayor of london he decided to have a a, a, a real london bus but it was terrible it was a disaster everybody hated it and then the Brexit campaign began. And one of the key moments, one of the key elements of the Brexit campaign was a big bus, a big red bus, which was painted with some disinformation. 
um, saying that if uh, the e if if uh, Britain left the EU, they would save 350 million euros a week, uh, dollar, uh, pounds, what well, currency, a week, and that they would have that money and they could spend it on the on the national health service because the Brits love the national health service. The British government doesn't, but the uh, the people do. And in fact, they could build a new hospital every week and things like that, which uh, they didn't seem to be doing. Anyway, so back in the day, if you went to Google and looked for Boris and Bus, what you would get was lots of information, very critical to Boris Johnson, very critical, and also talking about the fact of the, the Brexit bus. So it was either critical of him in the, in the sense of the new London bus was very bad, or critical in the sense of the lies, the disinformation about the Brexit bus. So, are you familiar with the term search engine optimization? Does anybody here know what search engine optimization is? Okay, so in, in case you don't know, so search engine optimization, when you use a search engine, something like Google, take it as an example, the important results, uh, the results everybody sees, are the results right on the front page, right? The, the top results. The rest of the pages don't exist. There are millions of other pages, but nobody ever visits them. So in the world of digital marketing and things, the most important thing is to get on the front page of Google and to get as high up on that front page as possible. And there's this kind of arcane, magic, alchemist skill, snake oil, something, which is called search engine optimization, which is a process by which you can manipulate or you can maneuver so that the product or the thing you want gets onto the front page of Google and gets very high up in the listings. The day before uh, this video of Boris Johnson, if you looked at the Google, rank, the Google front page and you put in Boris Bus, everything was negative. However, if you looked at the top stories on Boris Bus after that, the top stories were Boris Johnson, I make models of buses, mesmerizing, I make models of buses, okay? So, by making this very, very, very strange presentation, suddenly, if you look at Boris Bus on, on uh, Google, all of the information is about this strange video. Now, if you look at that, that video, it's a pretty weird video, right? The dude at that time was trying to become the leader of the of the uh, Conservative Party. And if you look at the face of the journalist who's interviewing him, the journalist is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, what is going on with you? And if you look at Boris, he's kind of like, you know. Boris is good. I mean, a lot of politicians, a lot of other people couldn't do that. Boris is great at that kind of stuff because nobody is surprised when he does that. Everybody's like, yeah, that's him, that's Boris, he does that stuff. So he's just, you look at him and he's not looking at the camera and he's kind of like, contradicting and it doesn't matter he's just making this statement but the important thing was that if you look at Google after that suddenly the Boris bus I make models of buses mesmerizing so the interesting thing is that some tech experts a company that specializes in search engine optimization say that he's cl the claim that he relaxes by painting buses was a ploy, was a plot to change the rankings of Google, the search engine optimization. Okay. Here's the article. Boris Johnson, the unlikely SEO strategist, search engine optimization, SEO. And if you look at Boris' Brexit bus, you still find these results. And here's the famous Brexit bus, the 350 million. Okay, but if you look at, if you don't look at that, if you just look at Boris Bus, you only see the other thing. Okay. Now, does anybody know what a kipper is? Fish. Yes, it's a type of fish. Smoked fish. Uh, you, in the, when I was young, it was very popular for breakfast. My dad would eat that for breakfast. Not so, not so popular anymore. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a smoked fish. However, Kipper in the UK, according to Wikipedia, may refer to, to many things. And this is the specific thing we're interested in. It also refers to a supporter of the UK Independence Party, UKIP, a British uh, populist political party. 
So, kippers. So, Boris, of course. Boris appeared uh, talking about kippers. He held up a kipper and he claimed that EU rules meant that British kippers could not be sold around the world. And it uh, turns out that was disinformation, fake news, wasn't real. But the interesting thing about this is that Boris, back in the day, in October 2014, he was saying that there wasn't a lot of difference between the UKIP and the Tories. And the issue with that was that it used to be that if you put Boris and Kipper into Google, you would find these stories. And Boris now was running to be the head of the Conservative Party, and it did not look good for Boris to be associated with UKIP, especially as UKIP was pretty much a dying party by then. So it didn't look good to do that. So Boris stands on the stage and gave some false information about the fact that the that the EU were blocking uh, kipper sales from the from from Britain. So it's possible, it's plausible that the reason he was doing that was in fact to change this thing. That if you look at the term Boris Kipper you only find him talking about the fish and you don't find this kind of information. Now we have to go back some time because Boris Johnson used to be a journalist and he used to write in the Daily Telegraph and the, uh, he was associated with something called the dead cat strategy. Here's an article by him. So he Back in the day, he was talking in 2013 about a dead cat strategy. And I'll just read to you what he said here. To understand what has happened in Europe in the last week, we must borrow from the rich and fruity vocabulary of Australian political analysis. Let us suppose you are losing an argument. The facts are overwhelmingly against you, and the more people focus on the reality, the worse it is for you and your case. Your best bet in these circumstances is to perform a manoeuvre that a great campaigner describes as throwing a dead cat on the table, mate. That is because there is only one thing that is absolutely certain about throwing a dead cat on the dining room table. And I don't mean that people will be outraged, alarmed, disgusted. That is true, but irrelevant. The key point, says my Australian friend, is that everyone will shout, Jeez, mate, there's a dead cat on the table. In other words, they will be talking about the dead cat, the thing you want them to talk about, and they will not be talking about the issue that is causing you so much grief. So when that interview took place with Boris talking about the bus, just previous to that, the police had been called to his house, or to the house of his partner, where there had been a violent altercation. There had been some shouting and things. And the police had gone to the to his house, uh, to the house of his partner. And after that, he refused to talk to the press. He did not talk to the press about anything. He disappeared, which is unusual in Boris. He disappeared until he uh, appeared again, talking about making buses from boxes and things. And can you imagine what happened when he began talking about buses and boxes and things? Nobody was talking about this anymore. This disappeared because everybody is, why is this guy so strange? Why is he so freaky? Why is he talking about buses and boxes? And this information disappeared. The problem with this is we can't prove anything. Because how do you prove that Boris doesn't spend his night painting boxes, of bus painting buses? That's really hard to prove, right? So, but the dead cat strategy. Dead cat strategy or dead catting refers to the introduction of a dramatic or shocking or sensationalist topic to divert discourse away from a more damaging topic. A strategy or at least the dead cat metaphor ascribed to it is particularly associated with Australian political strategist Lyndon Crosby, who was the uh, who worked for the Conservative Party in the elections. Now, in the old days, we used to have different methods of fooling the public. Sarkozy, for example, would stand on a box. 
okay? This, these days, we could call this cheap fakes. In the world of deep fakes, does every, has everybody heard of deep fakes? Deep fakes is the kind of algorithmic manipulation of image or audio to produce something um, that's very, very difficult to detect. This is called a deep fake. But this is kind of a cheap fake. Instead of using technology, you stand on a box next to the person you're standing on and you look big and macho. You can use this disinformation in other ways. Apparently a French politician, he was suffering from some, uh, some bad publicity at home, so he put this photo, this photo was released on Twitter or something, and uh, everybody you know, talking about what a, what a great guy he was, climbing mountains and things, but if you look, he wasn't actually climbing a mountain at all, he was kind of crawling along. That's the kind of thing that people have always done, okay? That's always happened. People have always manipulated images and things in this way, but this whole new thing, of consciously okay, manipulating information. But if it's true that Boris Johnson in this situation was consciously using this situation, manipulating it to change the results of search engine optimization, then we have a problem. Because if we normally go to search engines looking for information, trying to check information, but that, in, that very inf information is being manipulated by very skillful people doing this kind of stuff, then we have a serious problem. And what can we trust? One of the issues with this is that the news cycle is, done, is driven by something called clickbait. As newspapers and as the traditional media changed, as, as the, the physical buying of newspapers and things changed, as it went online and newspapers especially lost their revenue model of people buying newspapers and of advertising, they changed to something called clickbait. Clickbait is a headline or something which encourages people to click on the link. As you click on the link, you go to that site and you generate revenue or the more uh, the more people that click on on your on your um, on your link, then the higher that will go in search engine optimization terms and things like this. So now we are in a new cycle, which is driven by clickbait. Um, and the issue is that even newspapers that don't have a, a big readership physically online, they can have a very very big influence. The Daily Mail, for example, in the UK is a, is a newspaper which is not a very high selling newspaper, but it has a huge influence on discourse in the UK. Okay, and it is a specialist in clickbait. Okay, all of this side is here. This is all clickbait. Click on this, click on this, click on this, and actually they have affiliate links in those articles as well. Buy the clothes, buy the bikini, wear the clothes that the person's wearing. And there are some real, really brilliant experts in changing the news cycle. So I don't know whether you remember this case. Jeffrey Epstein uh, was accused of this uh, sex ring, sex trafficking, and uh, a friend of the current US president. And he died in prison. And this was Saturday the 10th of August. And a couple of days later, we discover that Pres President Trump wants to buy Greenland. And everybody around the world was like, why does Donald Trump want to buy Greenland? Um, well, guess what? Everybody stopped talking about the fact that Epstein, friend of Donald Trump, had died in the prison, and everybody started talking about 18 million results about, yes, Donald Trump wants to buy Greenland. And then all of the people in the press, all of the pub, they began investigating this. Trump's Greenland plan show he has no idea how American power works. In the New York Times, Mr. Imawa is a historian. And unfortunately, historians often can't see what's happening in front of them because they don't understand how the internet works. <laughs> Okay, so he probably understands a lot about history, but this dude has no idea how the internet works because otherwise he would be able to see that what's going on here is not a, a ploy about, uh, you know, how American power works. It's a dem actually what Trump is doing is a demonstration of how American power works. So, and then he did that. That's brilliant. This is the best thing I've ever seen. This is the greatest example of how to use social media how to do clickbait. I mean, that is just brilliant. Now, the problem is everybody thinks Trump is some sort of lunatic person sitting in the White House or Mara Gogo or wherever he lives, eating McDonald's because he doesn't trust the, the chefs in the White House. 
and spends his night tweeting and photoshopping. Now, I'm going to put it to you that he probably doesn't spend his night photoshopping. He probably has a team of people that do this stuff. I mean, the guy's brilliant. He really understands social media. He understands how this works. And his team certainly understand it. And that is just brilliant. Because once that was tweeted, everybody started just talking about that. Okay? Nobody was talking about what he'd been going on about the day before. Any other thing? And if you watch Trump, this is what he does all of the time. And as the, this media analysis says, we are all caught in the dizzying Trump news cycle. Donald Trump, Bon Boris Johnson, these people, they change the news cycle by what appears to be random crazy statements, random crazy things. I'm going to buy Greenland. I paint buses. And the press just go, ooh, brilliant. Let's go and investigate why Boris paints buses or why Donald Trump wants to buy Greenland. And then they f forget. If there are any members of the press in the room, please pay attention to this. This is very important. What I saw is that there are only conservative leaders there. Do you Yes, of course. <laughs> it's very important to have uh, questions and critical thinking. It's all fake. Yes, it's all fake. Um, and the great thing about Boris and the internet uh, is it's the gift that keeps giving. Because yesterday, things like this started appearing on the internet. First I mean, uh, image, pictures emerge of Boris Johnson's proposed bridge across the Irish Sea. Revised artist's impression of Ireland to Scotland, Boris Bridge. Does everybody, did anybody see the news yesterday about the Boris Bridge? No. Boris Johnson announced yesterday that he is definitely, seriously, very, very seriously, definitely, very seriously, seriously, very definitely, seriously, very definitely considering building the bridge between Scotland and Ireland. Yes, it's been for many, many, many years. And the interesting thing is that this hashtag has started appearing on Twitter now, dead cat. Because since, this because since all of this kind of recent information about Boris Johnson, people are very, very skeptical now and now are using this, and they're putting things like release the Russia report. The Russia report is the report about Russian influence on Brexit, okay, which was, was sat upon from before Boris was um, elected. So now the interesting thing about this, as I say, there's the hashtag. It's still people are still tweeting about it. Lots and lots of people tweeting with this hashtag of dead cat, talking about Trump, talking about Boris, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, let's try and put my theory to practice here. Boris Johnson suddenly, yesterday, started talking about building this bridge. He's talked about it before, as you said. It's been mentioned before. And it has been said to be a completely crazy, very, very super expensive plan. But what was happening in Britain yesterday? Michael Gove confirms, confirms post-Brexit trade barriers will be imposed. Oh, but didn't they say when it was the election and if you vote for us and we have Brexit, that wouldn't happen? Hmm, I think they did. And this information was released yesterday. But what were people talking about yesterday? They were talking about a bridge between Scotland and Ireland. What else was happening yesterday? The appeal, appeal court gives 11th hour reprieve to the detainees who were due to be sent to uh, Jamaica. It, it, after the Second World War, lots of people were invited from Jamaica to live in the UK and to become British citizens. And the British Home Office has lost their papers, and now they're no longer British citizens. So people that have been living in the UK for 45, uh, since 1945 and their children are being deported because they are not British citizens. And yesterday, a flight was ready to take off with these 50 people. It was finally stopped at the last moment by the appeal court. And what else happened yesterday? The elections in Ireland. Sinn Féin won the elections in Ireland, and they are beginning to try to form a government. Now, one of the ambitions of Sinn Féin ha is, and has, and has always been, a united Ireland. Now, the interesting thing at the moment is that Britain is probably, you could call it, the disunited kingdom. And an interesting thing, of course, about this 
He says, this shows a physical infrastructure linking parts of the United Kingdom in the face of a united island. Okay, so all these things were happening yesterday, which was the moment when this bridge was announced. So it appears, many people on Twitter, as, we, as Eureka said, you know, you can't trust everything that's on Twitter, but a lot of people are questioning this. Um, as I mentioned, we're kind of moving into a crazy world where you are going to have to start questioning and investigating and thinking about all of these things, not just from a position of Sarkozy standing on a box, but from the position of what is happening around news stories, how the news cycle is being prepared and what is going on with those things. Okay? And are we being subject to manipulation of search engine optimization? Because I think that's a very new thing. The dead cat story, making a different story, something else, that's been around for a long time, but it's like, specifically, we're doing that now. Looking at search engine optimization, looking to manipulate how people receive their information, beyond the fact of, I look at Spiegel, I look at The Guardian, I look at this. If you go to Google, which is actually the ranking of how we access information, yeah, and if you can manipulate that, then that is a completely new thing. So it's a new world we're going into, but it's not just there. I mentioned earlier something called uh, deep fakes. And this is a very important thing. Uh, going forward, we're going to have to look at many other things, many other areas related to information, disinformation, etc. So I'm going to introduce you and I'm going to play a game with you now. This is a website called whichfaceisreal.com. And one of the technological developments in the last couple of years has been something called a GAN, a Generative Adversarial Network. Is that right? Something like that. Uh, what does that mean in reality? That means computers can generate very realistic looking human beings and it's very hard to distinguish if they are real or not. So on this website, you have some real people and some photos that have been generated by computers and we, you can try to decide if the person is real. Sorry, I'm just going to move this so people, you can see better. So you can decide if the person is real or not. So if I want you to look at these two images, I know it's hard to see in here. If you believe this person is real, please raise your hand. If you believe that that person is real, do not believe your, do not raise your hand. If the guy is real, raise your hand. If the woman here is real, do not raise your hand. Okay. 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 So let's see. Is this person real? No, that, that, that person is not real. That is a fake. That is a computer-generated face. This person is the real person. Okay? That was the first one. I mean, it's difficult at the beginning. Let's try again. <laughs> Let's play again. So, the lady here, is that she real or is this person real? If you believe this person is real, please raise your hand. Okay, let's, let's check that. Is this person real? Incorrect. Okay. Yes. For example, as Raphael is pointing out, the first thing I would look at here, the first thing I saw when I looked at that picture, is I would look at those earrings. It's very unusual. Uh, it would be very unusual of a woman dress, uh, of a, a, type, a certain type of woman, or dressing formally, dressing with earrings that are separate or different. It depends on the style. If it's a younger person or a person that was dressing in a different type of style, they might might do that. That's just one example, but that's not a technical example. Let's try again. Now, let's see if you're getting how this works now. So, if you believe this person is real, please raise your hand. If you believe that person is real, please raise your hand. Uh, please do not raise your hand. Okay, if this person is real, raise your hand. Okay, a few people believe that. Let's see. Incorrect. <laughs> so, this person is not real. Okay, so you get the idea. You can do this at home. Okay, go to whichfaceisreal.com. 
and you can do this. This is from the University of Was Washington, and it's from a, a university course, which is something like uh, Against the Bullshit, or something like that. Yes. Which face is real? Uh, yeah, which face is real dot com. I think up here, yeah. Okay, and the interesting thing is that on this site, they also, if you go to uh, the methods, sorry, and learn, maybe it's learn is better, they actually explain how this, how this functions. And what you can look for to see if people are real or not. So glasses are difficult to make, for example, asymmetries, hair, etc., etc. And there's actually another site, which is interesting, called thispersondoesnotexist.com. And as you see here, it generates a new picture every time you go there, and it, it gives you the explanation. Image by a GAN, uh, by a GAN, and explains this. Don't panic. Learn how it works. Help this to AI. This is a form of artificial intelligence. Help it to continue to work. Okay. So there are big investigations into artificial intelligence. Now, can anybody tell me why you might want to use a face which is generated by artificial intelligence? Yes. Yeah, for example, on a dating site or something like that. Another thing, <laughs> exactly. You can you can have big crowds of people in images and things. Now, and that's a very interesting thing because if you want to find out the origin of a picture, you can do what's called a reverse image search. You can go to like Google Images, or you can go to a website like TinEye, which is a very which is a specific thing, and you can put a photo into there. You can either upload a photo, or you can put the URL of a photo, or Yandex, uh, which is a Russian search engine, which is actually the best one for doing this stuff. You can put uh, put an image up there, and it will investigate all of its databases and find out if the where the image is from, where it was originally from. And the, a great example of that was one that, in fact, we use in B-Secure trainings in the schools is there's a photo, there was a campaign on Instagram of this like little boy, really nice looking little boy. And he was, the accusation in the Instagram thing was that this, this little boy had been, uh, had been abused by, uh, I, I believe in Germany, by, um, uh, by asylum seekers, by refugees who were seeking asylum. When somebody did a reverse image search on that, it turned out that the photo was actually from a website about best haircuts for young boys. And that, in fact, that photo appears on lots of, uh, on lots of these things. So that's how it's used. And another example was that recently there was a spy discovered on LinkedIn, a person's profile on LinkedIn, who was considered to be a spy. All of the information, the university, all of that, is correct information in the sense that that exists, but that person didn't go there. And the face that was used on that profile was one of these faces. It was a person that does not exist. Okay. And of course, that's perfect, because when you put that image into Google, you're not going to find that person, because that, that, that image has been generated by a computer. Okay, So this is the world we're in now. This is happening. This is out there. Deep fakes, misinformation, using search engine optimization, using public uh, discourses and things to manipulate and to misinform or disinform in this way. It's very, very, very sophisticated. Eureka mentioned like the trolls, the bots and everything on Twitter. That is a huge, huge business. I mean, enormous business. There was a, a company in Poland that created, uh, I believe it was, uh, I can't remember the exact figure now, 40,000 fake profiles but with job history, with work history, with the university, with the background and all of these things, just waiting to be used in a certain situation. And you can buy those things for cheap. It's like, you know, for $20 you could buy a bot army and things. So this stuff's out there. This is what's happening. We have to be very aware of it. And it's going to be very hard going forward for us to be able to trust information. And really the only way we can deal with that information is by educating ourselves okay, on how information is spread, how it's, uh, how it's used, etc., etc. So I'm going to pass you on to Raphael, who's going to look at some of those techniques and things. I will let you switch slides. Um, yeah. 
So, so yeah, what I'm going to do now is to give you some uh, techniques uh, that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis when you receive an information and want to, uh, to check if it's real and if you, for example, should retweet it or share it with your, um, uh, with your community and with, the fr with your friends and so on. Because one of the most common thing on one of the ways the algorithm work is by um, looking at how much an information has been retweeted or shared and just commented on. Uh, and then if many people comment on that information, they will, uh, like the algorithm will just like move it higher up and more people will see it. And it's just like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Basically, you, you just have more and more, the same information that could be a fake that will be seen by more and more people. Uh, so one of the things to keep in mind is uh, avoiding as much as possible hate retweet or like basically when you have some information that you are really against and like that you really don't like, you, you will often just like tweet it and con basically confirm it uh, by, by commenting on it. Um, and it can also be a problem if it's an information that you really like and you are really agreeing with it. Um, but again, if you didn't check it, it's also going to be uh, a problem if it's actually fake. Because to keep in mind that internet is amazing. Internet is really something that we really need and it's really, really good uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to get our work done and to communicate with friends. Um, and you have stuff like that on it. So what is on it to like in here? I mean, that's just, that's the internet right here. Like kittens shooting, eye, uh, shooting laser from their eyes in the, in, the, um, in the sky. It's just amazing, right? Um, so yeah, basically on the internet, anyone can say anything. Like it's basically if you are at a bar, like just at the bar in the corner of your street, uh, and someone is like saying a thing, uh, and it turns out to be wrong, but uh, internet is way bigger. You have way more people talking about things. And um, if, you are, if you are a flat earther online, you can find a community of other flat earthers, so people thinking that the planet is flat. Uh, and you can find a lot of friends, you can find thousands of people who think that. Uh, it is definitely stupid, not a terrible idea, and wrong, uh, but people can just, see, you can find them. Um, to find someone like that, to find a community of flat earthers in Luxembourg, it's going to be complicated. You will have a hard time to find enough people to actually feel that it could be true. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, like the first thing to look at is the trustworthiness of the website. So I am going to use um, something called a Crash Course. And um, Crash Course is a really nice um, channel with a lot of really, really good information uh, and really good uh, topics and covers. Like basically, it's like a, a class of like videos of like 10 to 15 minutes talking about different topics. And um, this channel is called Navigating G Digital Information. So I'm just going to show you like three or four uh, clips, but I really strongly recommend you to have a look at it uh, and share it among your friends because it's going to make everyone's life a lot easier. And it, yeah, it's really, really useful. So fact checking sites. So in the Stanford study, college students, history professors, and fact checkers were all asked to look at two websites. One website belonged to the American Academy of Pediatrics, or the AAP, the main professional organization of pediatricians. The other site belonged to the American College of Pediatricians, or the ACP. Now, of course, they sound very similar, but the ACP is actually an organization that broke away from the AAP because the AAP supports adoption option by LGBTQ couples. The AAP is a large, well-respected professional organization. My kid's pediatrician is a member. The ACP, on the other hand, is a much smaller, more ideologically motivated interest group. But looking at the two sites, many of the professors and students thought the ACP's site was more credible. Why? Because they focused on the site itself. They spent time examining and reading the website, noticing that there were footnotes and checking out its design elements. One student said of the ACP's website, I can automatically see this source and trust it just because of how official it looks. Even the font and the way the logo looks makes me think this is a mind hive that compiled this. The ACP's website may have looked official, but when compared to the AAP's website, its information was less reliable. 
AAP is the trustworthy group. So the professors and students focused on the websites themselves and how they presented information to decide which was more credible. That meant they didn't do a great job of evaluating the source itself. The fact checkers, on the other hand, did much better because they consistently asked themselves three questions while evaluating the sites. One, who is behind this information? Two, what is the evidence for their claims? And three, what do other sources say about the organization and its claims. These questions are a really useful framework when you want to interpret the accuracy of information you've encountered. Let's begin with who's behind the information. First, we want to know who exactly is sharing it with you. A friend on Facebook? A stranger? A news organization? Is it a promoted post that a company paid to insert into your feed? An anonymous social media account? And then we should ask ourselves why they are sharing it. Each of those shares mentioned could have very different reasons for presenting information in a particular way. I am, for instance, incentivized by my career to say that I think teenagers should read contemporary fiction, specifically contemporary fiction written by me, and I am more likely to share stories of people who benefited from reading contemporary fiction. And even your personal friends have motivations for sharing what they do online. They may want to signal what kind of person they are, or wish to be seen as, or they may want to win over others to their worldview, or they may be trying to get someone's attention with a subtweet. A journalist might be sharing information because they think it's important for their readers to know, but of course that decision is based on their own personal experiences. An advocate for a particular cause might be sharing information to persuade others to join that cause. Once you've established who is sharing the information with you and thought about why they might be doing so, you can get to the heart of the matter, the claim itself. Take a moment to identify what, if any, claims are actually being made. It could be a factual claim or an opinion statement. Reading is a useful skill is a factual claim. Reading The Fault in Our Stars will make your life better, clear your skin, and improve your wardrobe is an opinion statement, and a true one. Next you'll search for two things, whether they've backed up that claim with evidence, and whether that evidence is from a reliable source. Evidence could come in the form of a link to the article or study they're referencing, it could be a video or photo illustrating what they've described, it could even be the name of someone who made the claim in the first place. The next step is to look at the source of this evidence. Is it a reputable source, like a trusted news organization, or an expert in the field, or is it from some random blog you've never heard of? Does it back up its claims with other sources or explain how its information was gathered? If you've never heard of the source of this information, you can use a search engine to discover what others say about it. The sheer existence of evidence is not enough to verify a claim. The absence of evidence, on the other hand, is reason to be skeptical of its veracity until you can verify it. And that brings us to the final and really vital step. What do others say about this claim? Whenever you're checking on the truth, you can and should check multiple sources to see what other information is out there. Check a search engine or a website known to be an authority on the topic to see what others have published about it, and if a trustworthy source backs it up, Great! If you can't find evidence for that claim, or you find evidence to the contrary, then you can be fairly certain it's not true. So these three questions, who's behind it, what's the evidence, and what do others say, really kind of put information through the ringer. Let's try it out in the Thought Bubble. Here's a tweet from Steve S. at Steel. I will, I will keep going on that uh, in, a, in a sec. Uh, but yeah, so it is, it's a lot of things to look at. Um, and it is, it is important to keep in mind that you will not be able to do that all the time with everything you receive. But if you share that kind of information, that kind of like good practices with people you see, and if you uh, teach that to kids, um, you will it's basically distribute the, um, the trust and increase the trust in your network and have people finding out also that for you that maybe what you just said is actually wrong or what you just share is actually not true statement. Um, so that's just like to keep in mind just like a bunch of a bunch of steps that if you do it once like once a day on one information you receive it's already a lot better than if you don't do it uh, and if you get more people to actually do that same thing it will be way way better and improve uh, improve your life quite a bit. Um, so yeah that's just what we what we've seen in the video um, yeah 
So let's keep going on uh, on the slide on the on the video because that's what they're going to talk about here now with like what um, what the initial reporter he is and like who who that person is who are sharing uh, that information and how we can cross check what they are talking about. Seller O. Let's try it out in the thought bubble. Here's a tweet from Steve S. at SteelSeller002. Each American uses 25 plastic straws daily. We should use metal ones. All right, let's begin by asking who's behind this information and what motivated them to post it. His profile says his name is Steve S. His handle is SteelSeller002. So you search Steve S. SteelSeller. It turns out SteelSeller002 sells steel. Perhaps he loves the environment and wants to help reduce waste. He also might just want to sell more steel. So now you look at the evidence of this information. He didn't give us any. Even if he had provided a source that wouldn't guarantee its trustworthy claim should be backed up by evidence, and not all evidence is created equal, but the absence of it is suspicious. Finally, you want to look into what other sources have to say about this claim. As we've established, some are more credible than others, but all sources have their limits, so it's important to seek multiple trustworthy sources when fact-checking. You do a simple internet search, number of straws used by Americans per day, the New York Times cites two research firms that say America as a whole uses between 170 and 390 million straws per day. But search results from Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and The Seattle Times cite another statistic, 500 million per day. Some publications, though, say that statistic was compiled by a nine-year-old who polled straw manufacturers. Regardless, that estimate is still fewer than two straws per American per day. So we have no consensus, but from our research, it seems somewhere between 170 and 500 million straws per day is more accurate. Far fewer than Steve's claim. Steve. Thank you, Thought Bubble. I just, we, we were just talking about the name Steve and whether anybody is named. So, so yeah, as you can see, like you can relatively easily uh, check some information that you've seen. And um, it didn't take that much time. But it's definitely slightly longer than just like uh, retweeting that comment and saying that it's a stupid statement and um, or that it's a true statement. Everyone should use steel. Like just taking a few minutes to look it up is going to be already a really really good uh, use of your time um, and will avoid spreading something that is definitely wrong and said by someone who is uh, selling steel. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's um, the next thing that you can start looking at when you want to cross-check information is the way you read the articles. So there are like two ways to read things. You have vertical reading. Basically, that's what happened. You basically take a website and scroll down, just like you stay on the same website and just like le read information on it. It's, uh, it's, it's nice, uh, but the problem is that anything on that same website has been created by the same people. Uh, so if that website, that's what we've seen on the website of, uh, of that steel seller, is that even if the same website says they are, you, they are internally friendly, it's still them saying that, and you didn't cross-check any of that information. And you, ca you aren't able to actually figure out if it's true in, um, if other websites or other sources are confirming it or not. The other way to do it is to do lateral reading. And lateral reading gives, makes your browser look like that. So you have your browser and then dozens of tabs. Uh, that's how mine look like. It's a bit, it's a bit of a mess. Um, but um, it is a way um, to figure out, like by looking at other sources and other people, what are other people saying about the same topic by uh, browsing other content created by other people. Uh, and again, I have. Um, I have a video for that. What you're not. The Stop City Funded Internet campaign is a good example of what I mean. So in early 2018, the city of West Plains, Missouri was working on a taxpayer funded municipal internet service project. If successful, it would provide residents with cheaper high speed internet. And while the city was working on this plan, a website for the Stop City Funded Internet campaign popped up. It claimed to be a grassroots community of local fiscal conservatives against the plan. The campaign site looked pretty 
sleek and professionally designed. It had a clear stated mission and high quality photography. Oh, and also a list of all the ways that municipal internet service projects have failed. And just by looking at the website, you would not be able to tell who was really behind that campaign because it didn't name names or list its leadership. But in the end, someone did discover the brains behind the operation. It was, of course, Fidelity Communications, a local commercial internet provider that didn't want to lose customers. And the only reason they came clean was because a Missouri man noticed the file name of the site's logo had Fidelity in it. But most of the time, we don't need to search source code to know more about who's sharing the information that we're consuming. We just need to learn to read differently. So we tend to read websites like we read books or articles. We start at the top of the page, look at the title, and scroll down from there. We read vertically. And many websites look legitimate when you're reading vertically because you're only seeing what their creators want you to see. And creators know what we think makes websites look authoritative. A well-designed logo, references and citations, professional photography, no grammatical errors or typos. And so when you read vertically, it is often impossible to distinguish reliable information from unreliable. But introducing other strategies into your reading, like looking elsewhere for additional information, can help you find out a lot more. When you're on a new website, instead of staying put and taking their word for it, you should just leave. Open a new tab and start looking for more information. That's called lateral reading. It's lateral because instead of moving up and down, you're moving from tab to tab. Basically, what I'm saying is that when your browser looks like this, it can actually be good news. Like here's a website from the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. This page from 2018 is about a back and forth in the federal government over regulating internet service providers like Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T. Regulating those providers could include setting the prices and rates for their services or whether they're allowed to collect tolls from websites or content creators, among other things. Apparently, ALEC is against government regulation of internet service providers. So we want to know who ALEC is. We can tell a few things by looking at their website, namely that this site is apparently not run by Haley Baldwin's famous uncle. Also, the site has a .org web address, which is often used by nonprofits. And the logo looks serious and kind of fancy. The website's easy to to use. Alex About page says it's America's largest nonpartisan voluntary membership organization of state legislators dedicated to the principles of limited government, free markets, and federalism. Its board of directors page lists many U.S. representatives and senators. And if we stay on this page, it all seems, you know, kind of boring and standard. But if you open a new tab and search Alec, okay, yeah, the first results are Alec Baldwin, you know, Haley's uncle. But below that and below Alec's website lies their Wikipedia page and a website called alecexposed.org. Toward the bottom of the first page of search results, there are news articles by websites like The Atlantic and The Guardian. These say that corporations and nonprofits are also members of Alec. We learn that one of Alec's stated goals is to bring corporate leaders and legislators together so they can craft laws. A search for ALEC members shows that AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon have all been members, which means the original article about internet regulation has some, you know, big conflicts of interest. Internet service providers obviously have a huge financial incentive to fight regulation, but the article doesn't disclose that. So in this case, lateral reading helped us find out who's really behind information, a huge group of lawmakers working with big corporations toward their common interests. All right, so now that you understand... So yeah, I just wanted to finish on one thing. One of the really easy starting points when you want to look at um, information about an organization, about people, is to start on Wikipedia. Yes, everyone can edit Wikipedia, but you, on Wikipedia you also have resources and references to stuff at the bottom of the article. And when you want to investigate on a case, if you go look at that, it will generally give you primary sources that are pretty reliable. And you can cross-check them and use that to again validate information that you've seen. Because as we saw, if you have a really nice looking website, doesn't mean that anything you find on that really nice looking website is actually trustworthy. So yeah, that's that's the two main points I wanted to discuss today is uh, cross-checking and looking like who is behind that information, why are they sharing it to you, and how you can um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, use lateral reading to make sure that uh, when you share something with your friends 
aren't with uh, or, or yeah like when you when you have when you see an information you want to share it with people just make sure it's not completely bogus from the beginning okay so uh, yes did you have a The reverse image search, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you show? Yeah. 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 Okay, so basically here, you would click. You uh, can either select a, an image. If I do that, oh. I can probably just get kind of the page here. Just the real one. Okay. So that. Let's see how that works. Okay, and you see it says there the same picture was not found. Okay, but it has similar images. Basically, you go you go to here, for example, and you can either upload a photo or you put a URL of a photo, and then you search, and the search engine will look for the and it, look for that image on the internet. In this case, because this is a face which doesn't exist, okay, it hasn't found anything. But if it was a picture of you, for example, in theory, you would find other images of you on the internet. And the interesting thing about Yandex is it would probably put your name and other information as well, which the Google image search and things wouldn't do. But Yandex has a, a very, very deep... Uh, um, uh, yes, for example, <laughs> because it's in Russia. <laughs> I was trying to be diplomatic there. You know, but it also the, alg the, the, the algorithm does actually look at uh, look for, look for other information, which possibly Google and others are blocking because of uh, because of where they're based or whatever. I mean, so it's basically any image you can just take it, and with Google, it's the same thing. You can go to Google image on um, Google image search here. It's the same thing. So you can take any any image and post it into there. Okay, so, yep. At the in any Wikipedia page, if you just open one up, Wikifeet. Don't go to Wikifeet. That that one will do. Just go to that page. I'll go to go to yes. yeah the website. Parasite. So if you go all the way down to the bottom of the page here, okay, these are all references from other articles. As you're reading through the original post, it has like one and two and things, and it links to these articles, and these are reference articles. So yeah, I don't know if you noticed it, but like in the video I just showed you, uh, in the um, um, text down here, you had stuff written like that with uh, brackets and then a number. And that's because at the, like under the video, you have the links to the references they are mentioning in the um, when they are speaking. So generally, like that's a good way. Like every time you see something like that, it generally means that you have a reference somewhere. And if you um, click on yeah. that, it will actually take you directly to that reference here at the bottom. So mm -hmm. yeah, because yes. uh, be it, yeah, because mm -hmm. everybody can do that, but it ha but it has a a, a, a review policy. Mm -hmm. It has lots of different rules and regulations of how you can provide information. And sometimes it says the information that's provided on this page is not correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, on Wikipedia, you have um, like when you have like a statement saying, "Yeah, this article needs more references." It's also good information for you because we know that when you open that article, you know that it's lacking references. So stuff that you will see on it is to take with some with a pinch of salt. Um, so yeah, it is just you need to keep that in mind when you have a Wikipedia article. On. In fact, you can have on every once a month or two, like once in a while, you have a news article saying that some Wikipedia page was changed and there was some fake information on it, like someone that was someone was dead and wasn't, but. It is still, I mean, it happens, and it's something to keep in mind, absolutely. Um, but 
it is still a, like having the options to have references to a lot of things is good. And yeah, you need to cross check something. When something sounds like either too good to be true or, uh, or sounds like just weird and potentially like, a bus, like is like a yeah, bus and li like wine boxes. Bus. Yeah. And when something is, some is causing you a lot of uh, response, like when something is like causing you to be mad about the thing, before just talking about it and taking it as true, cross-checking it is a good starting point. And it's an important point that Raphael's making is because we are all contributing all the time to disinformation. Even when we are retweeting something because we're angry at it and indignant about it. And this, for example, I showed you the Daily Mail earlier. The Daily Mail is a conservative newspaper in, the, in, in Britain, but the majority of the people that are tweeting that stuff are all people with left-wing opinions who are going, did you see this shit that the Daily Mail has done now? And then they tweet it and they have the link. So it gets spread and spread and spread. And that gives validity to the, to the thing. Mm -hmm. In, in the US, it was also uh, the nev Never Warren, I think, no. Never Warren hashtag mm. uh, was tweeted by a few conservatives and uh, then commented on a lot by people who are actually, are actually supporting her. Supporters of Warren. Um, so again, and it turned out that you had, a l like it was like trending and everyone saw that specific hashtag on information around it, even if they were supporting it. And again, most of the people who were talking about that were supporters. And it didn't help anything. Okay, I'd just like to say we can take we could take some questions now. But in case you have to leave, we we do another event both together called the Privacy Salon, which we do every month or so. And this is an event where we talk about different aspects of data, uh, how to use the internet. We give you lots of tricks and tips and discuss aspects of, of different things. Today, specifically, we're going to be talking a lot about data, how data, how our data is used and abused, and some tri tips and tricks and things you can do to avoid that, to control your data as much as possible. It's this evening. It's in 87 Route de Thionville. It's completely free. Uh, we'll be there this evening. So if you have any specific questions about anything from today or anything to do with how your data and things is processed or used on the internet or how you can protect your data, if there's any tools and things like that, that we'll be doing that this evening. So you can come along there. But if you've got any questions now about anything we've talked about today, please, we have some time to, to ask. You've got a microphone there and questions. videos that we saw. No, it's, ju um, it's just speak into the microphone because it's okay. Ju just for the videos that we saw on the fact chain of um, fact, fact checking. Fact yeah. checking is this uh, the site is uh, change. So yeah, it's on. Um, uh, oops, this one. Yeah. Uh, so it's called navigating Digi okay. digital information. Okay. Hi, I'm John oops, Green, and yeah. this. Um, and it is uh, basically if you just search for that, it's uh, created by Crash Course. Crash Course, yeah. and they do many different courses. Yeah. Uh, hello. I, I don't know if the question is for you, but do is is a fact that this happens. We will have certain age, and we may question. I personally question everything I see. Okay. Compared what it is, but you mentioned it at the very beginning. The key is to raise awareness on the children. Mm. Do you, does uh, Be Secure organize this in schools? Or yes. So um, Luxembourg is the only EU country where you have mandatory safer internet training at year seven. So every EU country has what's called a safer internet center. Be Secure is the safer internet center of Luxembourg. And we, the, many of the safer internet centers do training and different types of things, but Be Secure is the only, uh, sorry, Luxembourg is the only country where that's kind of mandatory. So we go to every school at year seven and we do classes, we do trainings in French, German, Luxembourgish, English, Spanish, Portuguese. So, but it's the only, the only place. Thank you. And it, uh, one interesting thing about the kids there, we've just showed you how to do a reverse image search. When I go into class, I don't know whether Danny will, uh, we have another Be Secure trainer here, I don't know whether Danny will confirm this. When we talk about this, I say, oh, does anybody know, uh, and how could you deal with this? And everyone goes, reverse image search. Yeah. It's like, obvious, man. It's like, you old boomer. Like, dude, you're coming in here and you're telling this stuff. And that's one of the issues that we have when we create material, because we're creating it 
as if it was for our generation. And we, we, it's very difficult to have the cultural understanding of what kids are doing. So when I show them the which face is real thing, for example, and I say, can you think of a use that you could have for that? And they go, catfishing. Please put your hand up in this room if you know what catfishing is. OK. So <laughs> all of the kids know what catfishing is, because that's the world they live in. Catfishing is impersonation. It's, an, it's when somebody contacts you, they're impersonating somebody, or they are invented a fake person, and they get in touch with you, either for sexual purposes or for whatever. But that's the reality that kids live in. That They know all the terms. They understand these things. And when they look at that, they go, for catfishing, obviously. Uh, you said dating. That's another use. Uh, you had a question? Yes, in, in spreading these uh, misinformation, fakes, and uh, all these uh, uh, bad dynamics, uh, do do you, as expert, consider that uh, anonymity of account is a big and uh, main issue, or not? I, I would say we have an issue here <laughs> so. with anonymity. Okay, one of one of the one of the great things about the internet, one of the bad things about the internet, is anonymity. Uh, the the beginning of the internet was fantastic. In the, everybody was anonymous or whatever. Facebook and other organisations impose a real uh, person rule, uh, and it, it's interesting because Facebook theoretically have this real name rule. But you see, that Facebook is the main platform. Facebook and Instagram, owned by Facebook, are two of the main platforms for disinformation and things. So the the kind of anonymity thing doesn't necessarily. Yeah, by saying that you, that somebody is using their real name, uh, they're a real person, doesn't actually work out that it stops people from doing this stuff. Um, I just need to add one thing on that: is um, attacking anonymity is always, always, always going to be to cause more problems than solutions. For example, if you take um, a, a gay kid in a conservative family. The way to access information online is to be anonymous and to hide what they are doing because they have parents who want to block that, for example. Um, or when you are, when you have people, um, like again, it's not necessarily much in Luxembourg, but when you have people who are, uh, want, to, want to share information about a government that, like an oppressive government, they need to have a way to share that information without being traced. Um, and the second you block that, the second you make it impossible or complex to do that, to access that information or to share information, um, the first ones to have problems and to end up in bad situations will be people who have, um, like, who actually have something to hide. Um, so if you can de anonymize something easily, they will be the first victims of it. One because someone who wants to do something illegal, is doesn't care about the law anyway. I mean, that's the point of doing something illegal. So someone they, they will not they will not care about any of that, uh, and they will just find ways. Why? Mm -hmm. That's a, a very good way to show uh, where illegal activities uh, could come from. That's exactly the opposite. That's because of KIC. That's a lot of illegal activity in finance and uh, uh, and so on are, are going. I mean, absolutely. The thing is, um, if you end up, if you block, if you like block people from being anonymous, um, like on a general basis, you, you cannot decide who is going to be anonymous on the internet. Like it's always going to be either everyone can have solutions or nobody can have solutions. And you need to have a balance uh, that works. So yeah, you need to have, the police needs to be able to do their work, but also uh, you need to have some ways to be private somehow. There's another issue yeah. about, of anonym, uh, anonymity, and this is about data, about data anonymity. Many uh, organizations, uh, especially working in artificial intelligence and things like this, using big data sets, are uh, frequently claiming that they can use information, that the information will be, anonym will be anonymous information, and therefore that they can take your health records, they can take all of this information, and it can be used, and it can be anonymized, and it will not, um, the, the individual will not be able to rec be recognized. And in practically all investigations into that, that proves that it's completely, it has been shown that it's completely false. A new study came out this week that just by just by knowing a doctor, the specific a specific doctor where that doctor is, and knowing the location 
of the, because location is very important when you're looking at medical stuff, okay? The coronavirus, for example, very important location, etc. Well, if you know location and you know symptoms and things, you can actually identify that as patients. Algorithms will also out people. There was a famous case of uh, the Facebook algorithm, a psychiatrist uh, on, uh, on Facebook, and the Facebook algorithm suggested people that were his patients to be friends on Facebook because they looked at all the information about him and those people and they, they identified it. So it's a, really, it's a real big issue. Lots of people have been outed, lots of gay people have been outed on Facebook because of that as well. So it's a really, really difficult and complex question. But the anonymity of data, the claims that data can be un anonymized, is very, very, very spurious. It's like it's all of the, the to de-anonymize so-called anonymous data is pretty pretty easy. I was just in, talking about anonymity. I don't know if you hear of this company Clearview. Yes, of course. Because talking about the images, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it was exactly the case. I mean, they they mm -hmm. develop a tool that yeah. analyzes the images yeah. and propose uh, the, the for security reasons, mm -hmm. and then they found that the company was actually investigating the journalists who were investigating the, the data protection breaches or things like that. So anonymity is... Well, the, the inter so Clearview, in case you don't know, is a, is a company that was basically doing facial recognition services and selling it to law enforcement. But the interesting thing about that was when they developed their methodology and stuff, their training sets, uh, facial recognition needs training sets, whatever, they were basically scraping images off the internet, taking public images off the internet and using them as part of their as part of their um, facial recognition uh, software, which they then sell on to the police and sell on to law enforcement. Now, the interesting thing about that, of course, is your face is taken off the internet without your consent and put into databases, you know, that are operated by all of these companies. So, anytime, anytime your face, anytime your photo is, is appearing on the internet, you can be sure that it is being scraped, and that in things, for example, like which face is real and all of these things, your face, parts of your face, are appearing in that because the basic data, the basic data sets that those companies and organisations are using are us. That's how they get af that's how they get the faces that they put into their programs. They just scrape it off the internet without our permission. Okay, and the 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 uh, the director, the CEO of Clearview, was on the TV the other day, was being interviewed on CNN or something, and he said, "Oh, all that information's public. I've got every, I've got a First Amendment right or Second, whichever amendment it was. I have a First or Second Amendment right to take that information and to use it." And in fact, and he said, "Google and Facebook do that, and Google and Facebook are both because they're always desperate to pretend. Uh, to, sorry, to to uh, say that they are supporting privacy and things. They say no, no, because our terms and conditions are against that, and we don't allow that to do that. So don't link to us. But yeah, that's the thing. Our faces are already in databases, which are all being used both for analysis for for controlling these programs, but also for facial recognition." Uh, programs. So whether we like it or not, our, our our face has already been taken. If you've got, if your face appears anywhere on the internet, it is being used for those by those sites. I've got a, I've got a question about reliability. If you have a newspaper such as the Guardian, you know, if you scroll down, you've got references and a lot of other articles. Who actually controls them? Are they adverts, or does the Guardian generally check out uh, the re the reliability of these uh, in, in links? In theory, in the Guardian, as a, as a specific example, they do have content on the page, which they say this is paid content or this is an advertisement. The problem with that is that in these kind of studies that uh, Raphael was showing, where you have uh, people looking at newspapers and things. Many people don't, even though it says advertisement, they don't recognize that. If you go to the front page of Google, the first thing you see at the top there, it says advertised, it says sponsored, and people click on it. My son does that all the time. He just goes, he looks at something on Google, clicks, he was looking for, I don't know, Ryanair, so he clicks on the first thing that says Ryanair, and it's some agency offering Ryanair tickets. And I'm like, just write in Ryanair, but he doesn't write in anything. My son, uh, he, he speaks. He, d he doesn't use a URL. He speaks to, hey, Siri, find me Ryanair, or whatever it is. Because young people don't tend to write anymore into those things. So the veracity of information, in theory, a news site like The Guardian or whatever will put the sponsored material. But the, um, the problem is the, the sponsored material still looks like uh, a different arti uh, an, uh, an article. You might be interested in 
Yes, exactly, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you when you okay when you speak to Siri or Google or whatever, you are basically speaking in the equivalent of writing something in the search. Okay, so it just gives it all it does is returns the the information as if it's looking at Google. Yeah. Exactly. No, uh, on that you can't. You, the only thing you could say is take me to Ryanair.com. You know, or you could say take me to the official website of. Yeah, you have to because this is an in, an interesting thing we were talking about when we were talking about AI. We have been trained by AI to enter information correctly into these search bars because if we if we write the wrong information, we don't get the answers. So over the years, Google has trained us to write specifically how to look for information in Google. So when we look for information in Google, we're actually we have been trained to do that. Okay. So, and when we speak to Siri, and when you speak to Siri at the beginning, Siri never understands anything you say, okay? <laughs> and then you swear at Siri, and Siri t t gets angry because it's programmed to do that. <laughs> okay. A anybody else have a, a last uh, question that you would like to address? Do you, uh, can you give us names of some search engines that are less invasive than Google? I saw DuckDuckGo, but when I, when I use that, I don't find it as effective as Google because I try not to use Google too much. I use, I use StartPage, uh, okay. StartPage often uses Google searches, but what it does is it anonymizes them. It, so you see here, you've got this anonymous view and things like this. What StartPage does is it creates what's called a proxy. So it connects to possibly to Google, but it doesn't create it through your computer, so you can't be identified as doing that. Everybody, at some time, goes to Google because it's still the quickest and possibly the best, and as I say, we've all been trained on how to use Google, um, so we know how to do that. The reason I... No, exactly. That's that. That's why. It, so I I use I use Start Page for this reason. The reason I don't use DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is pretty good, but because DuckDuckGo is an American company, which means it's subject to the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act of the United States means that that company must give any information that is required by the government. Start Page is based in the Netherlands. So this is an important thing. It's not just the source of the information in the sense of are you giving the information to Google, but it's also Potentially, that you can be given information to, to to the to the American government in this context. So there are different levels, and this is the issue with privacy. The thing with privacy, we can help you to eliminate everything Google in your entire computer, for example. But that means that when you browse websites, you will get viruses and things because Google block a lot of stuff in your browser. Okay, so there are many things that can be done, but you always have to balance you know, what you want, because you can throw Google away, yes, but a lot of the internet is based on Google. Sorry, leaving Google aside, I heard yesterday you want to show me regarding privacy, that there are so many apps you download, mm -hmm. you find the source, they have information, even without passing, right? Yeah. Or sometimes well, they you do. ask, but whoever reads all the details will be found out. So you, do you have any advice? <laughs> You, you can go to this website. You can go to this website, for example, We Sell Your Data, which says, We sell your data and you get nothing. How it works, we sell your data, your data is sold by us, you get nothing. Our principles, we're transparent and secure and custom. <laughs> Happy client, number one. I'm definitely too young to be on the internet. And, uh, oh, they got my stuff, who we sell to. This is a great site because it's perfect for this kind of stuff. It's this is where your stuff's going. There are there any ways around this? No, with apps. I mean, you mentioned the terms and conditions. If you are getting an app for free, the flashlight app on your phone, for example, on an Android phone, is selling is selling your data. Okay, 
People that develop apps are making money. They're not developing it for, you know, because they want to give you a free flashlight. Sometimes they are. People that believe in free and open source software will do that. But generally, anything you install on your phone has a price, and that price will either be you pay or it gets your data. And it might not be explicit about getting your data, and it might get your data in a very roundabout way. Okay? Certainly, like location, things like that, the, the movement of your phone, okay, the actual movement, the, the, the fact that your phone oscillates and things, the battery, the bat uh, your phone battery gives all sorts of information. The battery, yes, the battery is used a lot for information. That if you if you look at you know the film about Edward Snowden, for example, you know you take your you take your battery out of the phone and put it in your in your freezer <laughs> so that it can't be because your battery is constantly giving you informa giving information about its state. Do, who uses WhatsApp? Do you use WhatsApp with your computer also, and they are connected to your phone? Sometimes you get a message from WhatsApp saying your phone ba on your computer saying your phone battery is low. Please plug in your phone to continue using WhatsApp. That's because it's connected and it's reading the information. It's reading the data. Uh, it's reading the information off your off your phone. I'm sure you have some. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. we are going to have to stop. Come now, come <laughs> come to the privacy salon tonight, <laughs> seven o'clock, Route de Thionville. We have the cheapest beer in Luxembourg because we're the, the hacker space of Luxembourg and we can uh, offer you the cheapest beer. We have snacks provided by Be Secure. We have lots of information from us and other people. So you can come along there tonight. And we, we frequently do those events. So if you can't come to tonight, you can look at privacysalon.lu and uh, see that. So I think there are still many questions, I am sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, we're I still here. <laughs> we're not leaving yet. So I don't know what I, you have to do. I have to stop this conference now. I really thank you for all the good information. I think extremely uh, useful for all of us uh, in, in whatever field we're working in. Let's give them a big applause. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us today. I, actually, I think this is a really important thing because it's it's very easy uh, and very simple for institutions to have a typically institutional um, event on days like this. So I, I think this it's was less institutional, but I think all the more useful. No, so and I, I, but you. I think it's the kind of thing that you need. The institutions should be doing, uh, you know, kind of broadening, and broadening we are. these things. So, so thank you very thank much you for, all of you. Thank for you. doing that.